Hey everybody, uh, Jeff Sansone back with another interview. Today I'm really happy to be welcoming uh, Rob Coloni. He's the uh, Ridgefield girls varsity basketball coach. And um, I'm just going to give you a quick intro because Rob has a, a pretty nice uh, history here for basketball. So Rob's been coaching uh, in the state of Connecticut since 09. He's in his second season as the Ridgefield girls head coach. Uh, last year, uh, as you can see on his wall behind him, the Ridgefield Tigers girls team won the FCAC championship coming from a seventh seed and, uh, you know, off a 17 and seven season and having a nice upset victory there to win the title. Um, he spent uh, six seasons in Wilton, four of them as the Wilton head coach for the girls. Uh, he was an assistant with the 2014 class double L state championship team. So I'm sure that was pretty exciting. Uh, Rob also had some collegiate work. Uh, he coached at uh, Sacred Heart University club women's basketball team from 2012 to 15 and also at a place that I think he holds pretty dear to his heart, the University of Notre Dame Club women's basketball team from 18 uh, to 2020, capturing the NIRSA Region 3 Championship in 2019. So, Rob, welcome. Those are That's a pretty pretty good basketball resume right there for a guy that we're lucky enough to have in, uh, in Richfield coaching our girls. So, good morning. How are we doing? Good morning, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot of credit to the people that I've had a chance to coach and, and – uh, definitely some luck involved uh, for, for, for my side, but um, it's, it's been great to kind of immerse myself in um, the passion of the Ridgefield community and, and certainly uh, appreciative to, to be on here with you and for all the work that you're doing in these, uh, you know, different times that we're in trying to provide content and visibility for our student athletes to their community that loves them so much. So thank you. You're, you're welcome. And it's been great. And, and Rob and I have a little bit of history. We, uh, we got to, and I had to look back, Rob, has it only been a year? Like, you know, Rob and I coached the off season, uh, you know, program for the boys. And I guess last year was our first year together, but it really felt like maybe two or three years with, with the amount of time we were on the phone together, navigating that COVID stuff, a lot of start, starting and stopping and, and, you know, the COVID protocols and, small practices. It was, it was tough, right? I mean, what'd you think of that off season for, for you being involved as a coach and, and maybe for your players, you know, with what they went through on the girl side? Yeah. You know, I think what's interesting, Jeff, is like we met each other like maybe a year ago, right? Like, so it's February. So maybe we met in December or January. And, and um, you know, I think it's so funny how life, uh, you know, ebbs and flows and you get into circumstances where you don't expect to meet people that you're going to become really good friends with um, and, and share passions and stories and uh, positives and, and negatives in life. And I think that that's, you know, something that I've really cherished about our relationship, just being able to have another sounding board, uh, you know, basketball is one thing, but just in, in my personal life. And so that's been, that's been a thrill for me. And I think, um, you know, your approach and, and the way that you care about the community has really uh, enlightened me and, and um, aided my approach in, in navigating uncharted waters for me and coaching the boys in an, in an off-season program. And then, you know, to layer on top of that, um, kind of the, the, the bizarre circumstances that we're in, trying to manage that, that really delicate line of making sure that we are keeping people informed and safe while also enriching them through athletics, which is something that, um, you know, our young community really, really desperately needs in this time. And so I'm really thankful that we were able to challenge one another to make sure that we were being vigilant, um, that we were being intentional and methodical with our decision making, um, and that we were able to provide something for our youth. And I think any team uh, any sport in the state of Connecticut or really any state, because this is not just a nationwide, but a global issue, um, really would be thrilled with, I think, the way that we handled um, bringing basketball back in a, um, you know, a nuanced way. Um, and so I think I'm thrilled that we're, we're now at the point of the year where we're, we're going to start a high school season in, in a few days um, officially with games. And um, I think you just try to get to the next one, right? You just continue to prepare. I think that uncertainty has been the most daunting thing going back to last March when everything really kind of shut down and, and you know, our, our season had ended at that point, but I know the boys were, were about to start their state tournament and weren't able to. And so I think when we look at, you know, finally being here again, just to get, the student athletes back in the gym and, and now they have a schedule, 
right? They have something where they can actually look forward and plan and game plan and, and prepare for other teams. And I think what that all does, like, yes, we're competitive and yes, we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to um, win games, of course, and, and create meaningful experiences. But I think beyond all that, being able to game plan week to week, game to game has now become a nice distraction. And, and I always say to our kids, when you come into our gym, you can leave your baggage at the door, whatever's bothering you at home, in your relationships, at school, you know, you have to pick it up when you walk out. Um, and, and that's a difficult thing because for two hours, you can forget about things that might be bothering you. And I think that's therapeutic for us as coaches too. Like, you know, we have all these things going on and COVID to layer on top of things that may present challenges in your own life anyway, um, to be able to come in and just drop that baggage and say, I can be loose. I can play. I can make mistakes. I can be energetic. I can feed off my teammates, you know, to be able to provide that experience and then say, Hey, we're game planning for Trumbull. Right. And then, and then we're game planning for West Hill and then we're game planning for Stanford and then we're game planning for Danbury. It just gives them something to look forward to. Whereas I think the last nine months were, Hey, we just hope we get to Wednesday. We just hope we get to Thursday. And so we're still hoping that we get to those days, but we're, we're layering on top of that. Um, a basketball uh, ideology or mindset, which is super exciting. Yeah, that, there's some great points in there. And, and, and listen, it was a great time with you in this offseason getting to, to learn how to coach better. I think you're an excellent coach and, and you bring a lot of value to, to the floor when you step out there and talk to these, these student athletes. And, you know, you know, when I was when you were talking, I was thinking maybe maybe this year could be different for you as a coach and for the other coaches in the program. You have students that like desperately needed this. And, and they might be like more attentive. Not that the last teams haven't been, obviously you had great success, but you know, these students, listen, I, I work from home and the only people I get to see for like months and months were you and a couple other guys I golf with. I mean, that was it. And uh, I, I missed that human interaction and I'm sure the students do as well. And I think now that you have a captive audience and, and, and they maybe in the past they'd get a game film or a, or a scout or whatever it is that you do and be like, okay, I guess I have to look at this. Now they're probably like, all over it, you know, because this is something that they can throw themselves into because there aren't all those other things going on in life because of this COVID stuff we're dealing with. And it'll be interesting to see how, listen, it's not a Richfield thing. Like you said, it's not an FCAC thing. It's a global thing. And uh, I know you and I agree that um, getting these, these young people in the gym was our top priority, no, no matter what it was, you know, even if it was for a short period of time, you and I um, put in whatever was necessary. And I know um, maybe people don't realize what happens away from the gym, especially for someone like you, who's a head coach, not just coaching a team, but running a program. Uh, I, I don't know that people appreciate just how much dedication and love has to be in, in, in the person that's doing that to make it work. And so kudos to you. You, you stepped into a program last year and took them right to, right to the, the finish line and, and got a great result. But I know it's not all about that. I mean, I, I think we all judge, uh, success uh not by the number of wins or titles that we can hang but how we affect young people's lives and 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 be in you know uh, an important influence on them and i know you take that very seriously and anyone that knows you you know knows that as well um let's talk a little bit about this year's team what what if what is it uh that you think you may have lost last year what have you gained this year and, and how do these two teams compare and what do you think you have to look forward to this year yeah, well, uh, thank you for, for your comments. Really, really kind. I think, um, you know, every year when you start fresh, uh, I think you're always looking, you're, you're looking forward, certainly. And I, and I, I really um, try to drill into my own head, uh, which can be a scary place at times to, to continue to look forward. Um, but it's hard not to look back and appreciate, um, you know, the journey. Uh, I'm a very reflective person. And, and I think it's, you know, when I look back on my first year in Richfield, I was terrified because, you know, I had really um, worked very hard to develop an immersive relationship with the community of Wilton before I accepted a job out at Notre Dame. And so when I left to go to Notre Dame, um, you know, that was really hard for me uh, because it was a dream job at, at a place that I, I love very much. Um, but I was leaving behind like uh, almost mission-based work. That's how I, I looked at it. And it was hard for me to explain that to anybody. You know, I think anytime that I would start to allude to that or mention that, um, 
it was challenging for other people to understand and, and that's fine. Um, and so when I was uh, given the opportunity to come back and, and I realized that, you know, this is such a monumental part of my life and I felt most comfort in Connecticut, in the FCAC, and certainly near to my family who's still in New Jersey, um, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Obviously, um, you know, I, I interviewed for the Ridgefield job and that was, uh, you know, that was challenging because it was uh, a school that we had competed, you know, uh, really heavily against. Um, I didn't grow up in the rivalry. Like I said, I grew up in New Jersey, so a little bit different, but um, you go into a new environment and you have to meet an entire new group of student athletes. And then what you have to do is meet their families. And then what you have to do is understand how the community functions and how the youth programs work and how can you immerse yourself in that? And how can you, you know, it, it, it is about, you know, I think the challenge in year one of any program for a, for a new coach is you, you have to be thinking about all these things because you could have really nice success because maybe you have some talented athletes and, and we did have talented athletes, no question. Um, but if you want to have long-term success and success that is beyond wins and losses, like you said, and is, is to its core predicated on engagement of the community, engagement of the young student athletes and the excitement they're in, um, you have to be really, really purposeful and genuine in, in your approach. And so I think for me, it was spending a lot of time, um, at Yanity and St. Mary's watching, you know, we're so fortunate to have two really, really great youth programs in town, giving double the amount of student athletes between, you know, really grades three to eight to participate in some type of organized basketball. That's unheard of. Um, and so to be able to show up at those things and not say, I'm the high school head coach, listen to how great I am, but to just sit back and be there. Um, is really important. And I think, you know, I was given an opportunity to contribute to the RBA board and, and meet you from a St. Mary's perspective. And so I think all these things, um, you know, really go into what you're trying to accomplish when you, when you take over a program, when you're given the opportunity to take over a program. Um, what do I miss about last year? I, I miss our five seniors a lot um, because there were fine, fine young women um, who are all going to do tremendous things. Uh, they gave me an opportunity um, to, to come in really because I think the trust starts with that group, the longest tenured group of girls who had played from freshman year to senior year. And, um, you know, three captains in, in uh, Cameron McClellan, uh, Megan Klazowski and Kate Wagner. Um, and, you know, you got three girls who earned all FC ac uh, accolades. And then I have, you know, two girls right now who earned all FC ac accolades at, at one point in their career. So when you look at what you lose, you lose that um, that really good relationship that I had a chance to, to generate and foster. And it's funny, they're still on our huddle. And you talked a little bit about, you know, uh, maybe people are more engaged because of the type of year. So we've had, we've had 47 logged hours of student athletes watching film in the last seven calendar days. Um, you know, there's, there's only 31 student athletes in our program. Um, so, so that's remarkable. Uh, considering that we've only had one game and it was a scrimmage and it was only a varsity scrimmage uh, and we've got our practices filmed and stuff. So they're, they're chomping at the bit. Uh, but Kate Wagner is, has watched six hours of film in the last week. And Kate Wagner graduated last year. So, you know, I think that's what makes you so happy as a coach is to see, you know, I could trade a text every now and then, or we could still see that they're engaged and they're passionate about the program. You know, I want, Every person who comes through our door, whether you play for one year or four, whether you're a starter um, or a role player, or you don't see many varsity minutes, I want them to feel like they had a profound impact on progressing forward um, because they all do, right? To play in our program is a challenge. Um, I think we ask a lot of our, of our, of our kids, um, but I, I can unequivocally say that they will be met with um, the utmost respect the, the utmost attention and care, and they will be coached. Um, and I think that is so much about how we prepare you for life to overcome adversity, to understand um, that there are better days ahead and that you need to fail to truly understand how, how to succeed. Um, so we say, you know, you don't lose. You, you, we learn. Um, we're going to, we're going to, that's why we watch film. That's why we read scouting reports. It's not about winning a game against Norwalk in February, right? Like that's, 
it's so important because it's what we're doing now, but it's in the grand scheme of things, not important at all. It's about understanding a means to prepare to be successful in whatever you choose to do in life. Um, and, and so I'm, you know, I take the approach with all of our teams that I, I want to have a really, really good relationship um, with our players and understand that every player is going to have a different relationship with me. Um, and so it's, it's so fun to marry basketball with that stuff and kind of almost disguise it so that when they get out, they're like, man, I, I really did have a good experience. And, and maybe some days were more challenging than others. And some days were more fun than others, but at the end of the day, you know, you're a part of something that's, that's really, really special. And so um, we're still in that build process. Um, we're lucky that we have 31 uh, young people who, who come to work every day and, and really grow into it. And I think for the ninth graders who are on the freshman team, they're, they're starting to understand what that's going to look like, you know, but we're not at the level yet where the boys program kind of has an understanding of what it takes to be in the program. We're growing that and we're building that. And I think the exciting thing, um, just like if you're in a business, um, these players are the people who are going to be those agents of change. They are looking through this evolution, this build program, this build process for our program, which is super exciting. So um, we've got we've got 11 on the varsity right now, five seniors, four juniors, two sophomores. Um, we're, we're very athletic. Um, we, we sometimes take ourselves too seriously, I think, but, but they definitely like to have some fun. Um, and I, I think we're going to be an exciting team to watch. I think we are going to be different than last year um, because we don't have that you know, four-year point guard that we had in Kate Wagner. We don't have that player coach type person in Cameron McClellan. Um, we don't have that, you know, best defensive player in the FC Act for four years in, in Megan Klazowski. But I think we have girls who can fill those roles over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the way you frame that, Rob, and, and how you talk about the bigger picture. I think if people from the outside looked at Ridgefield, they would say, well, they're, they, they win, right? But it's not about that. It, it, that's a byproduct of all the things that, that you and, and coach McClellan bring to, to your craft. Right. And it's about, you know, your, your mentors and nurturers and, and that stuff comes out. And if you do that right, and you, you know, you're going to win. I mean, you're just, you, it's going to happen because of the process. Right. And because you've laid out this framework and I think you're right on, listen, you and I, you know, we're, we're out in the world, you know, these kids haven't been there yet. And you, we kind of know what's coming. And, and I think that was a message for at least when I got to say goodbye to the seniors in, in the offseason this year. Really enjoy what's going on right now. This is – it's everything to you right now. And in a year from now, you'll be like, was, was I playing basketball last year? You know, like there's going to be so much more going on. But in the moment, you know, you don't have that perspective like, like maybe – some older guys like I have and maybe young guys like you still have too, but you know, that that's important to have that perspective um, as to what's important. And I think you've got some very dedicated athletes on your squad. Being a student athlete is hard. I mean, it's, it's hard and there's demands in this program. And I'm sure across, across the FCAC, you know, all the coaches deserve a lot of credit for, for putting in the time they do and the care they put into their student athletes. I know you've um, you pride yourself on having a good relationship with other coaches in the area that you compete against. And I've, I've seen it, you know, we'd be out to having a drink or having dinner and you make a point to go over and talk to some coaches that you recognize. So I know that's important to you because this is a community um, and, and you guys all have influence over, over the young people in that community. And I think it's great. I think you do a great job at that. So um, enough smoke blowing by you and me here. Let's, uh, let's get down to something fun, right? I want to do something called two truths and a lie with coach Colonia. Yeah. You ready? I'm ready. So, so um, you're from New Jersey. That's one. You have two FCAC titles in Ridgefield. That's number two. And you are a Yankee, New York Yankees announcer for five seasons. There's two truths in there and a lie. Which one's the lie? Uh, yeah, I don't have two FCAC titles with any team. Um, so I, I've, uh, <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to coach in four FCAC championship games, two as a head coach, um, two as an assistant. Uh, so we were 0-3 in, in Wilton um, and, and 1-0 in Ridgefield. Yeah, but uh, the Yankees thing, you know, I, I went to school for sports broadcasting. It's funny, you know, I – so this is like life, right? Life is – that. there's this line from The Office, which I, I love that show, and, and there's a line from it that's actually quite, um, you know, transcendent. And it, and it goes, I wish there, were, there was a way to tell that you're in the good old days before you left them. Um, and, you know, I think a lot about that line as my life moves into different stages and I 
um, am faced with different challenges. And, you know, when I was applying to school uh, to, to go to college for sports broadcasting, the only one outset to that was I applied to Notre Dame. And I, I wasn't, you know, I wish I had taken myself more seriously in high school um, because maybe I would have gotten in, but I didn't get into Notre Dame, even though I said I would major in theology, you know, I would, I would do whatever it took. To, <laughs> I, that was my strategy, right? Was maybe I can trick them. Maybe they don't have a huge theology program. So it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and I get a letter from, from Sacred Heart and uh, in Connecticut and I got accepted and I went to my mom. I, I remember this clear as day. And I, you know, I, I said, mom, I, I got an acceptance to Sacred Heart. It was my first college acceptance. And I said, I didn't apply here. Um, I never even heard of Connecticut. You know, we drive through it if we went to the Cape, but like, I'm not, you know, we had never, I went to the Jersey shore growing up and, and my mom goes, well, it's a nice Catholic school and we're going to look at it. And I was like, okay. Uh, so mom, you know, mom won that battle. And, and uh, so we, we, we drive up and I step foot on the campus and I'm like, this is where I'm going. And it just felt right, you know? Um, and I thought, Hey, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a neat opportunity because it's a smaller place. Maybe I can have an impact right away. Uh, I started a radio show and I used to literally, you know, I was 18 years old and I just went on every major sports team's website and picked off every public email address that I could find. And once a week I would send them an email and say, hi, I'm a college student. Here's my radio show. You could stream it online two hours long. Um, and I did that from August until February. And in February, Brian Cashman, the GM of the Yankees called my show. Um, and so I'm like 19 years old and I, I, yeah, I didn't know what to do. And afterwards he connected me with a guy who worked um, for the Yankees in their broadcasting department. Turns out that guy had a connection somehow to my grandparents who lived in Florida because his mom lived in Saratoga, which is where my mom grew up. Like all this crazy stuff started happening. I got an internship and then he hired me full time at the end of that internship. So I was 19 years old, college sophomore, and I was commuting to the Bronx and Sacred Heart every day, working full time. and was just like blown away, um, you know, and, and was given unbelievable opportunities to, you know, at 19 years old, broadcast Yankee games in front of 80,000 people um, in a brand new stadium. And they won a World Series. And, you know, I remember like, you know, I was on a float with Derek Jeter and Jay-Z and uh, A-Rod after they won the World Series and I'm interviewing these guys and I'm just like, what is going on? Like, you know, you never imagine that stuff's ever going to happen. Um, you know, and, and one thing leads to another and had a really good experience with the Yankees. And then, you know, my parents growing up ran a nonprofit hospice and they uh, provided end of life care for terminally ill people who could not afford to die peacefully or comfortably or didn't have people to die with. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, as did my brother and sister, and of course my parents, um, you know, caring for and with people on Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving, you know, we would leave our house and go and spend time at the inpatient facilities with these people. And I realized that my whole life, all I wanted to do was be a sports broadcaster and I was doing it at a young age for, you know, I thought I was going to start in like Arkansas or something. And, and uh, I, I, I was given or I earned or, or a combination of those two things, a, a tremendous opportunity, uh, but it wasn't fulfilling for me the way that I think my family had conditioned me to seek fulfilling work or to, or to do mission-based work. Um, and my parents thought I was crazy. They were like, what are you doing? You, you know, this is all you've ever, like my mom thought something was wrong with me. Like when I was growing up, I would like mute video games and I would broadcast them. Like, you know, and, and, and I was now at a point where um, I was, I was, I was doing things that I, I, I always wanted to do, um, you know, but it wasn't, I knew that it wasn't for me. And so I, I went back to school and started working at Sacred Heart and working with students first in financial aid who wanted to attend college but didn't know how they were going to afford it. And I, I worked with them to strategize on how we would find them additional aid without having to burden them with loans. And then, um, you know, got, got an opportunity to go work in career development and got to work with those same students that we said, hey, there's going to be an ROI at the end of the road for you with this college experience. And then I got to help them navigate their career search. And, and that led to Notre Dame and Notre Dame led to what I'm doing now. And so I think, you know, life is so funny where you just follow these little passions that 
uh, enable you to have an impact on other people or advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves the way that I hope, you know, one day if I'm ever in a bind, people might be able to advocate for me. I think that's, you know, that's the mission that you're after in this life. And so all the while, you know, something that, that always stuck out to me was coaching basketball. And whether I was working for the Yankees and commuting back to, to Connecticut, you know, I was coaching youth teams and the Wilton Basketball Association. And that led to an opportunity at the high school. And then that led to, you know, uh, the head coach. So it's just, you know, you find and develop those passions and you hope that you're doing a good job and you hope that you, you do it as long as you understand that you're not the most important person in the room and you're doing it for other people. And so as long as I have that feeling, I'm going to continue to do these things. And so um, the Yankees thing was an experience that I'll cherish forever. I've got some great friends still um, and some really great mentors who have been absolutely tremendous role models in my life. Um, you know, Mike Bonner, who was the guy who hired me, uh, Ryan Rucco, who now is all over the place on ESPN and Yes Network. And, you know, he was the guy who I learned from. And then Ryan got a radio show with Stephen A. Smith, and I got to work in Ryan's stead when he couldn't make it. And that gave me that exposure and that, that you know, so it just people have been really, really good to me. And, and I'm really thankful that I'm in a position where I can kind of live out the things that I think are important and the foundations that my parents and family have instilled in me to, to hopefully do right by other people. Yeah, I think when you go into something with, with the right intention, good things happen and clearly you do, right? You, you know, I, I love that story that you just told. And I think it felt like you and I had known each other forever just after a couple of weeks. We, and, and we were out one night after a game probably and the Yankee thing came up and I'm like, excuse me, <laughs> you, were the, you were the Yankees announcer for how long? You know, that's just craziness and how humble you are about it. And it's and like, if that were me, it would be my lead to everyone I met. You know, that would be the first, that'd be the first thing they would hear. But for you, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I did that and, and, and you have this great takeaway from it. So I, I just thought that was very cool. And I thought, I don't know that your players know that or the, I'm certainly if the parents know it, I think that's, I think that's a cool thing to know about you and, and also your other, you know, your upbringing and what you shared with us is shaped who you are and, and the kind of how you approach everything. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, we're going to wrap it up, Rob, but I can't let you get away. Uh, we're recording this on a very snowy Sunday morning in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Also happens to be Super Bowl Sunday. Um, and by the time this airs, and just for, everyone, for everyone's knowledge, we are broadcasting all Ridgefield home games. So the boys and the girls alike will be broadcast from Ridgefield Stadium with our huddle feed. And hopefully we'll be doing that live um, once the gym is outfitted with the technology to do it live. And until then, we'll be doing it from, from here. Uh, and we'll have some students doing it, if it once we get to the, to, the, to the stadium. And we're also going to try to figure out how to do it from road games, too. If those schools have a feed available, we'd love to do that, too. Uh, so this will air before the Trum – uh, not the Trumbull game. Who's your first home game, Rob? West Hill on Friday. Okay, so this will air before the West Hill game on Friday, uh, and the Super Bowl will be in the books by then. So um, I don't know if there is a prohibition on choosing Tampa Bay if you're in the Ridgefield program because someone has a, a dislike for their quarterback. <laughs> but, so, you know, if you don't choose Tampa, I'm going to ask you why, but who, who do you like? Um, so I'm rooting for Tampa. Um, you know, my grandmother lives in Tampa. She's, a, you know, she's from New York and, and is a big Yankee fan, big Giant fan. But uh, I'm rooting for Tampa because um, I don't like to see the, the same story twice. And while it might seem like Tom Brady always wins, um, I think it's, you know, Bruce Arians is, is a guy that I, I really like. Um, I, I, I think the Tom Brady story is so unique and neat that, you know, it's Peyton Manning. Um, you know, did it with the Colts and the Broncos and Brady's going to try to do it with the, like, I just think that's so cool to, to, to be such an impact or influential persona that you can lead people to a, to a common goal. Um, that being said, I mean, the chiefs are, are unbelievable, but I'm biased. Um, I'm a huge giants fan and I really don't like Andy Reid. Um, <laughs> because of, of all the years that he spent in Philadelphia and, and all the heartache he presented me as a Giants fan. So uh, I'm rooting for Tampa, but if I was uh, a wagering person, um, I, would, I would probably not bet against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. But I'm rooting for Tampa. 
So that was a great, I mean, you should run for office because you didn't answer the question. <laughs> who, who you got? I mean, who you got, Rob? Let's go. Uh, I got, I got the Bucks, and I think they'll win 31-28. So in Tom Brady's career, he's been in nine Super Bowls. Every single Super Bowl has been decided by one score or less. Um, I think that's a fascinating statistic. I think in the two Super Bowls that the Giants beat him in, uh, 17-14, 21-17, um, he beat the Eagles in a game that, that really they were, they were, you know, this was 2004, they were trouncing the Eagles, and then the Eagles scored a late touchdown. So I think it ended up being 24-21. Uh, uh, they beat the Rams in that, in that 2001 Super Bowl by three, Vinatieri's kick. They beat the Panthers 32-29 in 2003, um, you know, and, and then he lost that game to the Eagles. But so I think, I think it's going to be closer than people think. And I also think gone are the days. And we saw, I mean, I think the last Super Bowl blowout that we saw was um, the one in, in New Jersey uh, where the, where the Broncos took that early safety and the Seahawks kind of just rolled. Um, but we don't really see too many Super Bowl blowouts anymore. I mean, even last year, right. The Chiefs scored 21 points in the fourth quarter, but they were losing, they were losing to the 49ers. Yeah. Um, so I think, I just think it's super hard to get on this stage and blow another team out, um, you know, this day and age. I know Super Bowl blowouts were, were pretty commonplace in the 80s and 90s, but just not really anymore. Now, how does COVID affect with limited capacity fans? How does COVID affect with the fact that they haven't had to do the burdens of media day, right? They haven't had to get to the site two weeks early and sit through, you know, these are all the things that I'm thinking about, like, <laughs> I, I, it just and I have no skin in the game, but it just fascinates me. Like, how does this play a role? The Chiefs got to practice in Kansas City, and they only had to get to Tampa Bay yesterday. They didn't have to stay in a hotel. Tampa Bay is the first home team in a Super Bowl ever. Maybe that would have played a larger role if COVID wasn't a thing, and the Chiefs had to stay in a hotel for two weeks, and the Tampa Bay Bucks didn't. But all things considered, everything was done like this through Zoom, so maybe it didn't really matter. So. Um, you know, it's going to be fun. Uh, I love the Super Bowl. I think the worst part about it is now we have to wait till August to get college football back. So um, hopefully high school basketball can hold us over until then and we can go from there. Yeah, I'll be worried about you if, if high school basketball doesn't, you know, go all the, all the way to the wire this year. I was worried about you in the offseason a little bit. If uh, I really hope you get all your games in. And uh, listen, you should have a, a sports talk show. I mean, you analyze that Super Bowl pick you know, more than anyone. I just had an interview with the boys coaches. Um, they all took the Chiefs, Wolf, Romeo, and Volts. Uh, I was the only dissenter taking the Bucks. So you and I are on the same page, not surprisingly. I think, uh, I, think I, I look at Tom Brady the same way. He's just uh, someone who has um, – it's amazing what he's done. And as a Jets fan, it's, it's pained me over the years. But, you know, uh, you got to respect greatness. I was a Knicks fan, and I love Michael Jordan. Uh, I'm a Jets fan, and I really think Tom Brady is, is transcendent. So it'll be, it'll be cool. Either way, it's going to be a really good game, I think. And it's going to be either passing the torch to Mahomes, and he's going to win it, or Brady just marches on. But I took the Bucks, And uh, what are you doing? You're going to have a little uh, couple of chips and some dip and staying home with, with, uh, with your girl and the dogs, or what's going to happen? Yep. Yeah, we got to figure out what we're going to eat. And I think, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll – We'll just sit back and enjoy. It looks like I haven't I haven't opened my blinds yet, but if you say it's snowing, I tr I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, great great talking to you. Uh, you know I'll be cheering you on, and uh, we'll catch up during the season. Hopefully, best of luck in your opener on the road against Trumbull. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate all you do for us and and your friendship. All the best. You as well, Rob. T talk to you soon.